Starting our list off at number 10, Roman Shipwreck. Right off the coast of Palermo, Sicily, archaeologists have discovered not only an ancient Roman shipwreck, but jars mainly used for transporting wine and olive oil. We found a long lost grocery run, it seems. The second century vessel sits in the Mediterranean Sea at around 302 feet deep. Now, it's a shock that this thing was ever found. It's not an extremely large vessel, and again, it's quite old. Wine trade was the bread and butter of the Roman Republic, specifically the wine known as Mamertino which was Julius Caesar's favorite. He loved that one. That was an excellent one. So this discovery really is a two for one, all just lying at the bottom of the sea. Number nine, Lake Ontario. Back in July 2011, a Canadian schooner, believed to be around 160 years old, was found off the shores of Lake Ontario. So we ask, what went wrong? Did it hit something? Was it abandoned? What happened here? Well, when it was found, the ship was carrying around 480 tons of coal. Now, normally that's manageable, but this fateful voyage was caused by a leak that developed on both sides of the ship. That plus the coal equals bad news. The water was coming in too quick and with the help of the 480 tons of coal, it was unstoppable. The original search for this ship began in 2009, but it took two years to find. Number eight, Norfolk Royal Shipwreck. Okay, so this initial discovery happened back in 2007, but it was a secret until quite recently. On May 6th in 1682, a ship called the Gloucester got stuck on a sandbank off the coast of Norfolk. Then an hour later, she sank, sadly. Now, one of these passengers was the future King James II of England. He escaped at a small boat, a quick decision that changed the course of history nonetheless. But two diving brothers found the ship back in 2007, so now history has literally resurfaced. And now we can talk about it. Only months ago it was announced officially that this was that lost ship. Maritime expert Claire Jowett calls this recent discovery the single most significant historic maritime discovery since the raising of the Mary Rose, which was King Henry VIII's favorite warship back in 1982. So number seven, the MV Joyita. The case of the MV Joyita began in 1955, and when we think of shipwrecks from the second century, that's, you know, quite recent in comparison. The MV Joyita, this case is baffling, and dare I say, it's a little paranormal. A lot of unanswered questions out there. November 10th, 1955, Captain Gerald Douglas was sailing his merchant ship from Suva, Fiji to Fanatuti, which was the capital of Tavula in the South Pacific Ocean. Now that's when he noticed the MV Joyita. It was tipped over, sitting there, not fully sank, but the port side rails were dipping in and out of the water. A search and rescue team went out for six days straight to find any survivors. From the 6th to the 12th, they searched, and after searching for hundreds of miles in the Pacific, they found nothing. They found no survivors, no clues, nothing. There's a book that tries to solve the mystery called The Mary Celeste of the South Pacific. But what do you think? If you have any theories on the MV Joyita yourself, sound off below. Number six, the Great Lakes Griffin. Back in 2018 in Lake Michigan, again, another Canadian discovery, diver Steve Liebert found what he believed was the holy grail of Great Lake shipwrecks. The Griffin sank back in 1679. Divers have been searching for this exact ship for years and years. Now, as a kid, Steve Liebert was talking about the shipwreck when his history teacher stopped and says, oh, who knows? Maybe one of you will find that griffin. Imagine that. Imagine your grade eight teacher telling you that somebody will find a ship and that somebody was actually you. Yeah, at 67 years old, Steve Liebert found the wreck. It was 2018, but his research began 40 years prior, so it was a long time coming. Liebert began diving in 1981. It took a long time to track down this long Long lost ship, but he did it somehow. This is like National Treasure 3. Let's do this instead. If you're in any Great Lakes, again, keep your eyes open for 50 foot long ships from the late 1600s. Those might be lurking below your feet. Those and sunfish, they're all down there waiting for you. Number five the deepest shipwreck. Who knows how many shipwrecks lay in our oceans, right? Considering how many of them have yet to be found and the ocean's way too big. It's so big, so unfathomably big. The USS Johnston, led by Captain Ernest Evans, was a US Navy destroyer which sank during the Battle of Leyte in 1944 after a standoff with a large fleet of Japanese warships. The destroyed ship laid at the bottom of the ocean around 20,000 feet deep, just hiding in pure darkness until it was discovered in the Philippine Sea in 2019, only a few years ago. Diving crews had been unable to reach it for an up close look, of course, because it was so deep. And to put an idea of how far down this thing was, well, it was 60% deeper than the Titanic. So as fascinating as it is to find something, now it's still a challenge getting down there to actually see it. I can't even touch the bottom of an in-ground pool without my ears exploding. So I can't even imagine. That's so terrifying. Number four, HMS Victory. This is one of the oldest wrecks that we have on this list today. And it took place on October 5th, 1744. It's a long time ago. The HMS Victory was a 100 weapon Royal Navy vessel. And on October 3rd, just a couple days before the wreck, the ship was in a fleet reaching the English Channel. A storm ended up scattering said fleet all apart from each other on October 4th, 
and the ships within the Victory lost sight of her. What happened to the HMS Victory remained a mystery for over 260 years. It wasn't until 2009 that the ship's fate was finally realized. Just 50 miles off the coast of England, near Plymouth, the US company Odyssey Marine Exploration, they ended up finding the wreckage, and when found, the ship's cannons were all still in pristine condition, with even their royal crests still visible underwater, despite, you know, being under there for nearly three centuries, hiding in the depths. This was also the first time that any trace of the 1,150 sailors that were on the ship was found, right? This whole time it's been a mystery where they went, what happened to them, all that. This answers a handful of those dark questions. This ship is also a reminder of how the cannons were once made. They were made fully of bronze. Number three, MV Donna Paz. This maritime disaster took place on December 20th, 1987, when this passenger ferry collided with the oil tanker, the MT Vector. Yeah, it was horrible. The collision took place in the Tabla Strait, which is about 180 kilometers south of Manila. This ship was carrying more than 4,000 people, which was actually double its capacity at the time of the collision. There were no senior officers on the bridge of the ship as well on the Vector, and there was no lookout. And it's thought that both ships lacked a functioning radio, so it's quite possibly the worst conditions imaginable. The weather and waters were both quite calm when the collision actually happened, and despite the clear visibility, neither ship gave an indication that it noticed the other one. So when the collision actually occurred, the 8,800 barrels of oil and gasoline on the Vector quickly ignited and engulfed both ships in flames. Only 26 people survived out of the, again, over 4,000 souls on board that day. Number two, MV Lajula. This was once a ship that was owned by the Senegalese government, and despite the fact that it was designed to carry a maximum of 580 passengers, on September 26, 2002, this ship had at least 2,000 people on board. Again, when it could only have 580. So we're starting to see where we're going wrong here. This is obviously a huge red flag, and it's coupled with the fact that there was a large amount of people who were sleeping on the ship's deck, which is of course above the center of buoyancy, these combined only made matters worse and the inevitable happened. The ship was en route to the Senegalese capital of Dakar and it sailed further out to sea than it was licensed to sail. It ended up encountering a storm at that point and then terribly rough waters. The ship ended up capsizing and out of the 2,000 on board, only 64 people survived the entire ordeal. Not only was this because of the fact that the ship sank exceptionally quickly, but it's mostly because rescue was not sent until several hours after the entire thing took place. And finally, number one. Ernest Shackleton. He braved the harsh conditions in the South Pole, and by 1914, Ernest Shackleton was ready to do it again. He set out with a group of 28 men, and they all had the intention to make it all the way across the continent, and then arrive at a ship that should be waiting for them on the other side. Well, things took a bad turn almost immediately. See, as they were on their journey to Antarctica, they all became trapped in the ice as their ship, the Endurance, started falling apart. Now from here, as they were trapped, their supplies slowly began to dwindle, and this led to men getting aboard life rafts to then float for 14 days through the icy Antarctic seas to an island. Now, unfortunately, once here, this was in the end, as the men then had to take another long journey all the way to the nearest inhabited island, which was South Georgia Island, which was a thousand miles away. It was horrible. It was quite a journey. Now, despite everything these men went through on this horrible, rough journey, all 28 of them survived this entire ordeal. And 107 years after its sinking, on March 9th, 2022, the Endurance, Ernest Shackleton's ship, was found in pristine condition. Yeah, it was found 10,000 feet below the icy Antarctic waters that it sank in, and the frigid temperatures mixed with the lack of sunlight, well, it's been sitting like Captain America. It's just sitting in time, just waiting. It looks like it's been untouched. It's actually really haunting to look at. In our number 10 spot today, we have musical instruments. Two parts of a destroyed clarinet, as well as a violin that was played by bandmaster Wallace Hartley, were found among the wreckage of the Titanic. I know musical instruments aren't exactly a terrifying discovery, but the discovery reminds us of the heartbreaking story of the Titanic's band. As the Titanic sank, it is famously known Known that the band played on despite the absolutely horrific incident that was taking place around them. At first, it was widely believed that they did this because they were ordered to, and for the record, if this were the case, that still would have been insanely brave of them. But as it turns out, this is far from true. The band members were in fact not ship employees, which means that they had the same rights as any passengers to leave. So why didn't they? Well, it is now widely believed that it most likely was so that they could use their music to help calm people so that they wouldn't panic. That's some major bravery right there. In our number nine spot today, we have a men's shoe. This artifact is one of the rarest to be shown of the items that have been recovered from the Titanic wreckage because of the fact that it is in such poor condition. All that remains of the shoe are the welt, top cap, and just a touch of the insole. This artifact does a couple things. It reminds you of the very real humans who became victims of this tragedy, and it also reminds you of the unrelenting nature of the ocean. Seeing the personal belongings of the passengers, regardless of knowing who specifically 
the shoe belonged to in their story just adds a personal element. Like you almost knew them. And then seeing how torn up the shoe has become is a strong reminder to us all that we truly are no match for mother nature. And the ocean is one of the most powerful and frightening things on the earth. In our number 8 spot today we have a love letter. Richard Geddes was a cabin attendant on the Titanic who wrote a love letter to his wife while aboard, but unfortunately she would never go on to receive it. The letter was written on the original Titanic stationery and it even had its original white star line envelope when it was found. While this story in itself is of course extremely sad and again one of those reminders of the human side of those who were in this incident, this letter also contained something else beside utterings and confessions of love. It also featured a description that Richard wrote for his wife of a near collision that the Titanic had with the SS City of New York, obviously prior to the terrible iceberg incident. There were people who had witnessed this near collision and believed that it was a bad omen for the Titanic. In our number 7 spot today we have a pocket watch. Okay, this artifact most certainly isn't the scariest one on today's list, but the story behind who it belonged to is one for the books. Sinai Cantor was 34 years old when he was a passenger on the Titanic. On board with him was his wife Miriam and the pair were from Russia. They purchased second class passenger tickets, which at the time cost them 26 pounds, which is about $3,666 in today's money. When tragedy struck and the Titanic was sinking, Sinai immediately thought of his wife. He was able to get her aboard one of the life rafts, thankfully, and as far as I know, she was rescued from the icy waters. Unfortunately, the same could not be said for him, however, as he ended up being one of those who passed away in the sinking of the ship. During rescue efforts, this pocket watch ended up being recovered from from his body. In our number 6 spot today we have the inspection card. This inspection card once belonged to a woman named Marion Meanwell. What could possibly be worrisome about an inspection card? Well, it shows how Marion was not intended to be on the Titanic, but by some turn of events she unfortunately found herself as one of the passengers. The card shows that she was originally meant to be traveling on a ship called the Majestic. For some reason the trip she originally had planned was delayed and she instead was assigned to the ill-fated Titanic. You can see that the word Majestic was crossed out on her card which shows us the change in plans. If only people were able to see what was about to strike and could have warned her. In our number 5 spot today we have the Titanic radio. Okay. Don't yell at me. This is a piece of the ship that has not yet been recovered, but it's the focus of much debate on whether or not it should be retrieved from the wreckage. Known in 1912 as the Marconi Wireless Telegraph Machine, the radio on the Titanic sent distress calls to nearby ships that ended up saving the lives of 700 people in lifeboats. Despite how many people died in the Titanic tragedy, many of their bodies have never been recovered, which is why there were debates about whether or not to retrieve the artifact because of the fact that there might still be remains located in the same area as the radio is. Lawyers have argued against the recovery of the radio because the dive plan did not include the prospect of there being human remains located down there. It also was argued because in order to retrieve it, they would need to cut into the ship's radio compartment which was strongly opposed by preservation advocates. As of right now, it appears as though the dive to retrieve the radio will still occur, but it isn't exactly clear when. This radio would be a very valuable artifact, but it also would hold an eerie tale of exactly when and how the radio was used during the final moments of the Titanic. In our number 4 spot today we have the telegraph. Separate from the radio we just talked about, the ship's telegraph machine was recovered in 1987 and this was used to relay commands to the engine room. So it was used as a communication device on board rather than to communicate with other ships. This telegraph machine is likely the one that was used to communicate to turn away from the iceberg in the North Atlantic Ocean. Unfortunately these commands came way too late as the ship struck the iceberg only 37 seconds after it was finally seen and we all know what happened next. This telegraph was actually part of a titanic auction that featured over 5,000 recovered artifacts that were selling for a combined some 200 million dollars. In our number 3 spot today we have the bell. The bell from the crow's nest of the titanic was recovered from the wreckage and returned to land where it now resides in the titanic museum. The eerie story behind this bell is that it would have been the one that was rung 3 times by the lookout. Frederick Fleet in order to attempt to warn of the iceberg that was ahead. Frederick as well as the other lookout who was with him, Reginald Lee, both ended up thankfully surviving the incident and went on to later explain what happened from their point of view. They explained that if they had been given binoculars to assist with their job, they could have seen the iceberg sooner. When asked how much sooner, Frederick replied, well, enough to get out of the way. In our number 2 spot today we have the big piece. This was a 15 ton section of the Titanic that ended up being recovered from the ocean 
ocean floor. The wreckage of the Titanic was not found until 1985 when oceanographer Robert Ballard was doing a secret underwater expedition. The big piece is about 26 by 12 feet and it was once a section of the ship's starboard side hull. This piece also has a part of the original support beam that attached this piece to the frame of the ship. It is said that where this piece was located on the ship, basically everything else around it was absolutely obliterated when the ship split in two. This artifact is said to be the reminder of the most violent aspect of the sinking of the ship, which is a horrifying thought. It was found among many other smaller pieces of the ship that had all been broken up. In our number one spot today, we have this cherub statue. In the remnants of the Titanic, they recovered a broken cherub statue that once found its home on the grand staircase of the Titanic. Aside from cherubs just being kind of creepy in general, there's something exceptionally eerie about this piece of religious iconography being at the center of such a huge disaster, as well as being found among the wreckage years later. Cherubs are usually known as bearers of the throne or creatures who attend to God, so it's just a little creepy to have one at the scene of a terrible disaster, as well as it making through all of the years and years that the Titanic was underwater waiting to be found. Starting off this countdown, we have the Half Moon Schooner Yacht. This was a German racing yacht that was built in 1908 Germany. The yacht was built as a wedding present for Count Gustav von Buglin und Haubach. Yeah, that was his full name. What a mouthful. Anyways, the yacht was eventually seized by the British during World War II and resold to become a US cabaret boat during the Prohibition era. In fact, its original name was the Germania, but when it resold, it got named the Half Moon. But the yacht ended up sinking during a terrible storm in 1930. Now it lies at the bottom of the ocean near Key Buscane, Florida. In fact, now it's a popular dive spot for snorkelers and divers. In at nine, the SS Mahano. The SS Mahano actually has quite the interesting story. Originally a passenger ship, during World War I, New Zealand converted the vessel into a floating hospital of sorts. After the war, though, it was returned to a passenger ship, which in my mind is kind of freaky. Like, like, yeah, this is a passenger ship now, but it used to house hundreds of wounded soldiers. Totally worth the ticket price. But I'm guessing the whole floating hospital thing kind of hurt sales, since the ship was sold to an Osaka shipbreaker company in 1935, who intended to tear it apart for scrap metal. However, the ship never made it to the buyer. A cyclone had severed the tow line connected to the Una, the ship that was doing the towing. You can now see the wreck on Google Earth on the beach of Fraser Island off the coast of Queensland, Australia. There was also a small crew on board that luckily survived, but if the ship was in such a state that it had to be towed, why was there a crew on it? Like maybe it was to maintain the ship or something, but I mean like if it was going to be used for scrap metal anyway, does it really matter? In our it spot today we have Costa Concordia. On January 13th of 2012, the Italian cruise ship Costa Concordia crashed into underwater rocks in shallow waters that they didn't see coming. The impact left damage to the ship and it started to sink. Eventually it capsized completely and sank to the ground. The rescue took a total of six hours and most passengers did make it back on shore. Sadly, 34 people lost their lives in this tragedy. 27 passengers, 5 crew members, and 2 rescue workers. The ship was unsalvageable, so it was left on the coast of Giglio Island in Italy, where it sunk. Images of the sunken ship have been captured on Google Earth. There are multiple photos of the ship laying on its side, and over the years you can see the ship become more and more deteriorated. And it's 7 to St. Christopher. The St. Christopher will likely spend the rest of its days, those in, in days in a sense being eternal because it's a ship, in the harbor of Ushuaia in southern Argentina. The ship, as a part of the Land Lease Act, was an American built rescue tugboat that served in the British Royal Navy during World War II. The Navy decommissioned it after the war and sold it to a man in Buenos Aires, Argentina in 1947. It was chartered for salvage operations but ran into engine trouble and rudder damage in the Beagle Channel by Ushuaia. The St. Christopher ran ashore in 1957 and was abandoned with the remaining fuel being drained to prevent an environmental disaster. But not until 2004. Great hustle, gents. Nearly 50 years later, huh? You really got your priorities sorted. I guess I had you looking in the wrong section. How could I be so stupid? I really hope that this, that trend isn't dead when this goes out. It might be. Coming in at number 6, we have the SS Jasm. This ship holds the title for one of the largest shipwrecks ever seen on Google Earth. The SS Jasm was a Bolivian cargo ferry that sunk on the Wingate Reef off the coast of Sudan. On the evening of December 1st, 2003, this ship sunk and to this day, it is still unclear as to why it sunk. On Google Earth, you can see this big white ship laying on its side. 
in the same position where it capsized. Besides that, the ship remains a mystery. Now it's another popular dive spot for scuba divers and snorkelers. Halfway through into number 5, the Garden of Eden. Now, I'm not a religious man per se, but I know the stories. The Garden of Eden was meant to be a utopia. Adam was placed here and told that he could eat from any tree aside from the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. They end up eating from the tree anyway and then are cast out of the garden. Well, in layman's terms at least. But there are many theories or ideas as to where this garden was on earth. Some think that it wasn't on earth, but multiple renditions place it in Iraq. One of them specifically claiming Basra as the location of the garden, which only makes this giant vessel off the coast even more intriguing. In the northwest section of Arvind Rood, you can see a capsized ship roughly 150 meters long and just over 50 meters offshore. And apparently this isn't the only shipwreck in Arvind Rood either. Just the, the only one that you can see, particularly from Google Earth. Coming in at number 4 we have the SS Francisco Morazin. On November 27th of 1960, the SS Francisco Morazin left Chicago and headed out towards Holland. They had 940 tons of cargo aboard the ship. However, they never made it to their destination. By day 2 of traveling, they ran into a wild snowstorm. The wind speed was going 40 miles per hour, and as a result, water was being swept aboard the ship. Not only that, but they couldn't see anything. They were blinded by the snow and heavy fog. With their vision being impaired, they accidentally sailed their ship right into shallow water, trapping them by South Manitou Island. Now, the crew ended up abandoning the ship and it was just left there. The ship's owner never came forward and claimed it, so it was literally left there to rot. You can still see it today, just chilling in Lake Michigan. Getting close to the end, into number 3, Skeleton Coast. Skeleton Coast sits just north of Luteritz in Namibia, and was named thanks to the countless whale and sea bones that had once littered the shore, thanks to its whaling history. However, nowadays, it's more so home to the skeletal remains of shipwrecks that are commonly caught ashore by rocks and fog. The 976 mile long, or 1,570 kilometers for the rest of the world, Skeleton Coast is littered with shipwrecks, and that's due to, if you don't mind a little science, when the Atlantic's cold currents mix with the warm air of the Namib Desert, they end up creating a cold, dense fog. The kind that Scooby-Doo would like cut a burger out of using a dead pirate sword and then eat. The burger, not the sword. According to BBC, the British Broadcasting Company, you crazies, the Khoisan Bushmen refer to Skeleton Coast as the land God created in anger, which is a whole other can of worms that I'm not gonna touch. Seems like a fun vacation spot though, if you want to get smitten by Chuck. In our second spot, we have the MS World Discoverer. And sadly, this one did not get to discover the world. The MS World Discoverer was a Danish cruise ship that was constructed in 1974. And for over 25 years, it changed ownership a number of times. That was until one day on April of 2000 when it took its last cruise. It was sailing in the Pacific Ocean when it struck an uncharted reef formation. Thankfully, all the passengers were rescued. The crew sent out a distress signal and a passenger ferry came to their help. All passengers were put on the passenger ferry. Now, before anyone could arrange to save the ship, it was actually ransacked and looted by locals. They then decided that saving the ship would be far too expensive and tough, so it wouldn't be worth it. So, they left it there ever since. On Google Maps, you can see this ship just chilling on its side. And finally, in at number one, the Costa Verde. An avid UFO hunter looking for signs of alien activity on Google Earth believes that he had discovered three new shipwrecks. Scott C. Waring posted his discovery on the website ufosightingsdaily.com, which usually features details of alleged UFO or alien sightings, a website that I didn't know existed until now, but I'm definitely going to have to look it up later. The alien hunter highlighted three dark boat-shaped objects in the shallow area off the coast of Costa Verde, which is a really weird thing to say, but in Mexico. He posted on May 4th, 2017, quote, You know me, always searching for the hidden mysteries of life. Well, today I stumbled upon something that's not a UFO, but is still absolutely amazing due to its size. One wreck, the first on his list, was 138 meters long, which is more than half the length of the Titanic, which you are also able to find on Google Earth, but you have to type in the coordinates to, to where it sunk. You can't actually see the wreck. Here's the coordinates if you want to look it up for yourself. It should be here somewhere. He also found a 61 meter long ship and a 12 meter long fishing boat in the same area, which makes me think maybe he did find evidence of aliens 
Oh. All right, coming in at number 10, we have the mystery of the mannequin boat. Following the Category 5 Hurricane Irma in 2017, a ghost ship washed ashore on Melbourne Beach in Florida. Mysteriously, the ship was intact, surviving the intense storm. Named Cucky, the 45 foot sailboat seemed to have traveled hundreds of miles before being washed up on the beach. No living soul was found on board, but two mannequins were found below deck, having survived the ordeal unseen. Scathed. What they were doing on the ship and what happened to the captain, sadly, we just don't know. Coming into number nine, we have the anonymous Jiang Seng. In March 2006, a slightly rusty ghost tanker ship was found off the coast of Queensland in Australia. She had a broken tow rope, which suggests that she was being towed by another boat and at some point broke loose. There was nobody on board when the Jiang Seng was discovered, but no signs of damage or piracy were visible. At first, sea officers thought the boat had simply got loose and were waiting for someone to claim it. When nobody did, they ran extensive searches of registered ships, but the boat had never been registered. When they checked the ship's engine, it was inoperable. Other than being identified as Jiang Seng, nobody knows where the boat came from. An Australian Customs Service spokesman said, it really is a bit of a mystery, I'll say. Coming into number eight, we have the mystery of High Aim 6. On January the 8th, 2003, a Taiwanese vessel, the High Aim 6, was found drifting in Australian waters. More in Australia, what is going on? When the ship was broached, there were no souls aboard, yet weirdly, there were no signs of distress. The boat was tugged to shore in Broome, Western Australia, where a forensic investigation took place. However, no signs of the crew were discovered. All that was discovered were seven toothbrushes and a cargo full of rotting fish. The boat's owner was contacted and he said he last spoke with the captain in December of 2002. One crew member, an Indonesian man, was later tracked down. Now, he didn't provide many details on his survival, but he did say that both the captain, Chen Te Cheng, and the ship's engineer, Lin Chung Li had been murdered. My goodness. Perhaps there was a mutiny on board or there was a hidden motive, but nobody has ever been able to fully explain it. Australian smuggling specialist Craig Kennedy said, I've been working with boats all my life and I've never seen anything like this. It's a bloody mystery. Sadly for the boat, it was later sunk off the coast of Broome. Coming into number seven, we have the SV Resolven. The Resolven was a Welsh merchant brig that was found abandoned between islands in Newfoundland by crew of the nearby HMS Mallard. Now, this all went down in August 1884. The drifting ship was in a fine condition, and initially, the Mallard signaled to see if the crew were okay. When they didn't get a response, they boarded the ship to find the gallery fire was lit and food had been laid out on the tables. The only thing was, there was no one to eat it. The ship had been completely abandoned. The ship's lifeboat was gone, as was the captain's stash of gold, leading some people to think that, you know what, maybe it was a mutiny. The most agreed narrative is that the crew mutinied, however, that doesn't explain why the stove was lit and food was laid out and never eaten. It seemed like people jumped off the ship in an absolute hurry. Now, the seven crew and four passengers were never found, nor was any trace of the missing lifeboat. The resolving case lay unresolving to this day. Coming in at number six, we have the SV Carol A. Deering. After passing Cape Lookout in North Carolina in January 1921, the five-mast cargo boat became wrecked, and basically it was run aground in mysterious circumstances. Her crew and her logbook were missing, nowhere to be found. The mystery of the boat's final voyage is one of the most discussed and written about maritime mysteries of all time. Weirdly, when the North Carolina Cape Lookout lightship spotted the boat a few days before she was found abandoned, the captain reported a thin man with reddish hair and a foreign accent acting strangely. He also noted a number of oddly placed crew members. What happened to these people over the next few days remains a mystery. It is suspected that the ship may have been a victim of mutiny as it had been reported that the crew didn't very well like the captain, with one worker previously arrested for threatening to get him. Others claim that she was a victim of the Bermuda Triangle. Five US departments of government ran investigations as the Carol Deering was one of a number of ships to be wrecked or missing in a short period of time. No information was discovered to 
explain the wreck and the missing crew. It's still unresolved. We have a nice little urban legend for you to pepper the middle of this list. We have the ghostly galleon of Chapel Cove coming into number five. I am a sucker for a good ghost story, especially when it involves pirates and treasure. In 1895, an abandoned ship dubbed the Ghost Gallon was reported off the coast of Chapel Cove in Newfoundland, a place I've categorically always wanted to visit. Now, this Spanish galleon was said to have been blown off course in the early 1700s and taken over by pirates. The pirates were said to have dispensed with the crew and took the treasure the Spanish ship was hoarding for themselves. Now, according to legend, they buried some of it in Chapel Cove. Now, Newfies watching, don't be tempted to go and look for it. It is said that those who go in search of the gold will see a vision of the ghostly galleon and be visited by its dead pirates who aim to kill. Yikes. Coming into number four, we have the SS Valencia. In January 1906, the SS Valencia was found wrecked off Vancouver Island in BC, Canada. The ship was struck, it hit a reef in bad weather. Reversed, the crew noticed a large gash in the hull, so they ordered her to run aground to prevent her from sinking. She was stranded on rocks in horrible weather and separated from the shore by 50 meters of choppy water. Six out of seven lifeboats were immediately deployed against the captain's orders. Three flipped while they were being lowered, two capsized when they were in the water, and one disappeared altogether. Two groups of survivors made it off the boat, one in the final lifeboat, and one by facing the tides and swimming. Of the 56 crew and 108 passengers, 136 people died as rescue teams struggled to get to the wreck. The survivors' awful tales of the ship floundering have marked history. Strangely, as the ship slowly sank, crew of the rescue ship, the city of Topega, reported seeing the shape of the Valencia in the black exhaust. Reports of eight skeletons dead in a lifeboat stuck in a cave were emerged. Some people even say they saw lifeboats being manned by skeletons rowing in the water. A phantom ship was later spotted by sailors sometime after the sinking. Some even reported human figures holding onto the ship's rigging. Even weirdly, 27 years after the disaster, one of the lifeboats from the Valencia was found a drift in good condition. What happened to it over the past three decades, nobody knows. Coming in at number three, we have the mystery of the Mary Celeste. The Mary Celeste is one of the most discussed abandoned ships of all time and a key player in maritime folklore. The real life story goes that in November 1872, the merchant ship set sail from New York. A month later, the boat was found near the Azores Islands, completely abandoned, but in a seaworthy condition. Now, this seemed to rule out bad weather playing a role in the mystery. The ship was filled with a cargo of alcohol and had food and water supplies for six months. Again, this seemed to rule out pirates. Inside the boat, there were no signs of struggle or affray. The ship's lifeboat was missing and the crew were never seen again. Now, this included the revered Captain Briggs and his family. Mutiny was considered as a possibility, but seemed unlikely given the ship's condition. Other theories included foul play by a giant squid and the Bermuda Triangle or a curse of a paranormal going on. Ghosts! The case of the Mary Celeste was so intriguing at the time that it has been frequently mentioned in literature and pop culture. Coming into number two, we have the Seo. In February 2016, the private yacht of Manfred Fritz Badgerat was found floating adrift in the Philippines. Sadly, the vessel's captain and owner, Mr. Badgerat, was found slumped dead at his desk in the boat. But this is where things get very strange indeed. Badgerat's body was found mummified. Now, people presumed this mummification happened as a result of sea conditions, basically dry and salty air and hot temperatures, which is creepy but explainable. This kind of coincided with the rumor that the German national had been missing since 2009. In the cabin, a letter to his wife who died in 2010 was found, which added to the mystery. Now, his mummified body was found near the boat's telephone system, suggesting that he was perhaps trying to make a final desperate mayday call. The plot thickened still when coroners who performed his autopsy said that he'd only been dead for little over over a week. How can we explain his lengthy absence and the fact that his body was mummified? 
There is almost no way that that could have happened in a week. Now there are photographs of the state that his body was found in, but we can't show you them in this video. If you wanna see them, you can Google them, but I have to warn you, it's not very pretty. Finally, coming into number one, now this kind of shakes me to my very core. We have the North Korean death boats. Each year, it seems that scores of derelict ghost boats wash ashore in Japan. A number of these are thought to be as a result of poor equipment leading to North Korean fishermen getting lost at sea and succumbing to the elements. The rest are usually the broken boats of deflectors who died in their attempts to flee the dictator-led nation. However, since 2015, more and more ghost ships with gruesome cargo began washing up in Japan. The grisly flotilla of 50 or so ships have washed up in the past few years, containing dozens upon dozens of bodies in varying states of decomposition. Some even arrived skeletal, suggesting they'd been dead at sea for a good number of years. On one occasion, the corpses were even headless, further adding to the mystery. The boat's markings and the clothing of those on board identified the vessels as coming from North Korea. Why they're dead, and even more frighteningly, why some of them were mutilated, we simply don't know. At number 10, we have the Flying Dutchman. Yes, we'll kick off this list with a boat who the famous SpongeBob character is named after. It would be amazing if you guys could hit up the comments and leave me a ton of SpongeBob memes. That would be awesome. But in real life, the Flying Dutchman is isn't a ghost, and Davy Jones' locker isn't a locker full of stinky socks. The Flying Dutchman was a real boat, and it was famously captained by Van Der Dekkend. He was trying to sail all the way to the East Indies with his trusty crew. The old school sailor life would have been amazing, except for all the pirates and scurvy and drowning to death. Well, they hit a massive storm all the way at the Cape of Good Hope, and even though Van Der Decken had one of the finest crew arounds, they were not able to make it through the storm. Now it's said that the ghost crew and the ship are cursed to sail the waters for the rest of time, and hundreds of fishermen have said that they have spotted the ship floating around the ocean fog. At number 9 we have Governor Parr. Alright, for this one we have something that is a little less exciting than a boat that is directly connected to one of the greatest cartoons of all time, but Governor Parr has its own charm. The ship was thrown together in 1918 and the world was never sweet to it. It was constantly under repairs, and in 1923 the ship was hit by such a large storm that it was nearly ripped apart and it was left unusable, and the captain was killed. This left the crew stuck on board with a boat with no way to get around, but luckily they were found. The Governor Parr was attached to a rescue vessel and they started to tow it, but not long after that the tow line was broken and the ship was lost forever. No one knows where the boat drifted off to, but some people think that the ghost captain is still on board refusing to leave the ocean. But realistically it probably sunk to the bottom of the ocean. Yeah. At number 8 we have the MV Joyita. What makes a ghost boat a ghost boat? Does it have to go missing from all of humanity, only to ever be seen in the ocean fog? Or could it be a boat where all the crew went missing out of nowhere? Well, if you're unsure, then you need to look in here. Look in your heart. It'll tell you what a real ghost boat is. And I think this one makes the cut. The MV Joyita was found in 1955 with no crew and very little clues as to where everyone went. The dinghies and the logbook were all missing, so there's a chance that the crew took off. But what makes this one so strange is that the people on board didn't need to bail on the Joyita. The boat was lined with cork and had fuel containers on it. All these extremely buoyant items made the ship pretty much unsinkable, so why did the crew abandoned ship and what happened to them. There were also some blood covered rags on board, meaning they could have been attacked by pirates or injured in a storm. But still, nobody knows. At number 7 we have Zabrina. This is such a beautiful name for a ghost boat now isn't it? If I was getting on a boat named the Zabrina, the last thing I would expect is all the people on board to die and there to be zero explanation as to why. Well I guess names can be deceiving because this cute little boat was a transport vessel for nearly over 40 years. She was built in 1873 and in 1970. She set sail through the south of France, probably to transport a bunch of croissants or something. Maybe not. I couldn't imagine a worse way to transport soft, flaky bread than a boat that was built in 1873. You couldn't deliver it. By the time it got there, you would just have a bunch of piles of slop and then some butter soaked tears running down your face. Well, for whatever reason, the Zabrina was found floating around in the south of France with no crew, no captain, and no explanation as to where everyone went. The ship was in pretty good condition, so it didn't make sense that everyone would just just get up and go. The theory is that a German U-boat snuck up on them, took the whole crew prisoners, but other people think that the crew is still sailing out
out there on a ghost boat. Ooh, ghost boats. That's what this whole thing's about. At number six, we have the Lady Love a Bond. This is a dirty story of betrayal, and nothing gets ghosts more worked up than having someone stab them in the back. Well, legend has it that this boat was set to sail in 1748. They were gonna do this as a way to celebrate the captain's upcoming wedding. What a nice celebration it must have been for him. Like, congrats, dude. Why don't you drive all your friends around a little bit? Nothing like working at your own party. Well, one of the captain's friends was also in love with his wife, and he was super jealous. God damn, this is some good tea. So what did he do? Did he try to steal his friend's lady when they were all out on the water? No. Did he try to poison the captain and throw his body overboard so no one could find out what happened to him? No. He took control of the ship and then sailed it into the Goodwin Sands, killing everyone on board. My god, dude. I think you could have figured out a better way to deal with this. But still, amazing tea. This is very spicy gossip. Now it's said you can still see the boat sailing around the crash site. At number five, we have the Jian Seng. The Jian Seng was a giant transport tanker that was discovered off the coast of southwest Queensland. When the ship was boarded, it seemed that whatever group of people that were on the boat left a long time ago. The ship was extremely run down and the engines were shot. But the weirdest thing was that the nameplates and identifiers were removed from the boat. Like whoever was on this boat or whoever was the cause of why this boat went missing didn't want anyone to find out where this boat was going or why. The only thing the people searching on the ship could find was a ton of rice. This is how they were able to determine that this was a transport vessel. While on board, the search party said they could hear strange voices and there was a constant presence that something was there watching them. No company, no country or person ever came forward to claim this boat. So when it was determined that this boat had no home, it was sent out to the middle of the ocean and then sunk. Damn dude, you didn't even strip it for parts? Just chuck it down to the bottom of the ocean? Seems like a waste. At number four, we have the Octavius. Good old Otto Octavius trying to take down Spider-Man in pirate form. Actually, if that's a thing, if there's an alternate universe Spider-Man comic where he's a pirate, please hook me up with a link to that in the comments. That sounds like the perfect combination of dumb and cool that always makes my brain happy. Well, unfortunately, this story has nothing to do with Spider-Man. This boat was found off the coast of Greenland in 1775. It was just drifting along because the entire crew had froze to death. The whole boat was just packed full of icy zombies frozen in place. Well, don't get the wrong impression. They weren't like real zombies like walking around. They were just frozen to death so they looked all creepy like zombie. You, you, you guys get it. You understand. One of the creepiest things about this is the captain. He froze to death at his desk trying to fill out a captain's log from 1762. That means this frozen pack of Jack Sparrows have been floating around on the water for over a decade. At number three, we have Carol A. Deering. I wonder who gets the job of naming all these boats because some of them are so dope, but this one stinks. Carol A. Deering? She sounds like she has a pencil case collection and complains about how pepper has a lot of kick to it. Well, this poorly named boat was transporting coal from Virginia to Brazil. It was a good old working boat. It made the trip there all right, but something happened on the way back. The boat disappeared and then was found abandoned off the coast of North Carolina. The lifeboats were gone as well as the crew's belongings, but there was never an explanation as to what happened. Everyone on board was gone. It could have been a mutiny, but we really don't know. At number two, we have the Caleuche. Here's a well-named boat, guys. Caleuche sounds like a dance you do to win the heart of your soulmate while simultaneously slapping a man to death. Well, this boat is part of the Aboriginal Chilean mythology. It's said that every night this boat would form off the coast, and apparently the boat is one massive party. It carries the souls of all the people who drowned at sea. That would be a great time. Everyone's dead and heading to heaven. It's like when you get super drunk on the plane heading to your vacation. Vacation starts early, baby. And at number one, we have Mary Celeste. All right, now we have La Creme de la Creme of ghost ships. It's of course the Mary Celeste. This boat is one of the most famous stories of ghost ships floating around anywhere. It was 1872 when the Mary Celeste was supposed to make the trip from New York to Genoa. She was carrying a ton of booze. It was around 1,500 barrels of booze, enough to give every frat house in America alcohol poisoning. But sweet Mary never made it to where she was going. She was spotted off the coast of Portugal. A ship went out to investigate, and much to their surprise, there wasn't a single soul on the boat. The lifeboats were gone, but the ship was completely intact. Nothing was wrong with it, along with all the booze. Every bit of booze was there too. So where did everyone go? Well, no one knows, and that's why it's number one on this list. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the SS 
Sultana. Starting off heavy with this list today, we have one of the worst maritime disasters in U.S. history, and it occurred on April 27, 1865. The SS Sultana was a side-wheel steamship, and on that fateful day, it exploded on the Mississippi River just north of Memphis, Tennessee. This incident took place in a time after the Civil War had just ended, and of course, the POWs held in Confederate military prisons were eager to get back to their homes after everything they had just endured. This led to the federal government paying a hefty price to steam operators for each soldier they took with them. This then led to a whole bunch of steam operators cutting corners so that they could bank on this deal. In the case of the Sultana, this meant safety things like repairing a leaky boiler or adhering to the capacity limits were cut. At the time of the explosion, the ship was carrying as many as 2,300 people, which was over six times the limited capacity. Unfortunately, the neglect of the boiler led to it rupturing, which initially took the lives of hundreds of those on board. After this, the already overloaded docks were made weaker and they ended up collapsing, which left people trapped. In the end, around 1,800 people lost their lives. While I'm sure there are many Americans and others from around the world who have heard of this tragic incident by now, at the time, not many people knew about it at all. If you remembered, this happened on April 27th, 1865, and President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated on April 14th, 1865, which ended up overshadowing this tragic event in terms of coverage. And it's not like there was a 24-hour news cycle back then where they were just constantly being bombarded with the worst of the worst. Even today, where we do have that, terrible things get overlooked and overshadowed all of the time. In our number nine spot today, we have the MV Donna Paz. This maritime disaster took place on December 20th, 1987 when this passenger ferry collided with the oil tanker, the MT Vector. The collision took place in the Tablas Strait, which is about 180 kilometers south of Manila. This ship was carrying more than 4,000 people, which was double its capacity, and at the time of the collision, there were no senior officers on the bridge of the ship, and on the Vector, there was no lookout, and it is thought that both ships lacked a functioning radio. That's what I like to call all bad. The weather and the waters were both quite calm when the collision happened, and despite the clear visibility, neither ship gave an indication that it noticed the other. When the collision occurred, the 8,800 barrels of oil and gasoline on the Vector quickly ignited and engulfed both ships in flames. Out of the over 4,400 people that were on board both ships, only 26 people were rescued from the waters and survived. It really makes you wonder exactly what happened here, because from an outside perspective, it seems like this tragedy could have been avoided. In our number 8 spot today, we have the MV Wilhelm Gustloff. This ship was a part of the Nazi Strength Through Joy program, which was an important propaganda tool during the Third Reich. This ocean liner is said to have carried German workers who were indulging in leisurely activities on cruises throughout the North Atlantic and the Mediterranean, but when World War II began, it ended up being converted into a hospital ship. Closer to the end of the war, this ship then switched gears again and was called on in order to evacuate German troops and civilians from East Prussia ahead of the advancing of the Soviet troops. At this time, the ship had shed its white paint with red crosses that symbolized it as non-combatant, and this, coupled with the clear presence of troops on board, as well as the anti-aircraft guns on board, well, it was obvious that this made it a viable military target. While it was built to accommodate around 1,900 people, on January 30th, 1945, as the ship left port, an estimated 10,000 people packed on board. Just after 9 o'clock p.m. that night, a Soviet submarine fired three torpedoes at the ship, which slammed into its side. Because of ice, many of the lifeboats were inoperable, and those who were on board that were best trained to deal with these kinds of emergencies and dire situations had either been killed in the blast or were trapped below the deck. Just over an hour later, the ship slipped underwater. Unlike a lot of the other wrecks on this list, rescue did begin just minutes after the SOS call was sent out, but still only 1,200 people were saved. With a death toll of somewhere around an estimated 9,000 people, this remains one of the deadliest shipwrecks in history. In our number 7 spot today, we have the HMS Victory. This is one of the oldest wrecks we have on this list today, and this one took place on October 5th, 1744. The HMS Victory was a 100-gun Royal Navy vessel, and on October 3rd, just a couple days before the wreck, the ship was in a fleet reaching the English Channel. A storm ended up scattering the fleet all apart from each other, and on October 4th, the ships with the Victory lost sight of her. What happened to the HMS Victory remained a mystery for over 260 years, and it wasn't until 2009 that the fate was found out. Just 50 miles off the coast of England near Plymouth, the US company Odyssey Marine Exploration ended up finding the wreckage, and when 
when found, the ship's cannons were still in good condition, with even the royal crests visible underwater, despite the nearly three centuries it had been. This was also the first time that any trace of the 1,150 sailors that were on the ship were found, as sadly, no one in the entire crew survived the wreck. In our number six spot today, we have the SS Kiangya. On December 4th, 1948, this ship was carrying thousands of passengers who were fleeing Shanghai due to the advancing People's Liberation Army. On this day, the official number of passengers was said to be 2,150, which was already almost double its capacity rate, but it's said that several thousand more people crowded onto the ship before it left the docks. I mean, this makes a lot of sense. It's weighing the risk of packing onto this boat versus staying in the situation you're currently trying to flee. As the ship got to the mouth of the Huangpu River, it is believed that it may have struck some sort of World War II era mine or something like that because it just exploded. Rescuers were also unaware of the explosion for hours, which only made the situation worse. Somewhere around 700 passengers were rescued, but this meant that a number estimated to be from 2,750 to as many as 4,000 people lost their lives in this explosion and the subsequent sinking of the ship. In our number five spot today, we have the RMS Empress of Ireland. The Empress of Ireland was a Canadian ocean liner that was out to sea on May 29th, 1914, when tragedy struck. The ship was traveling down the St. Lawrence River through some thick fog, which is what led to her colliding with a Norwegian collier, which is a bulky cargo ship that was designed in order to transport coal. The cargo ship didn't sink, but unfortunately the same couldn't be said for the Empress as she listed and fast. Water began pouring in through portholes, which led to those below deck meeting their fate rapidly. The official death toll of the crash is said to have been 1,012 people, and it still remains the worst disaster in Canadian maritime history. It makes me wonder how, as a Canadian especially, I've never heard of this accident before. The wreck of this ship still lies in a fairly shallow 130 feet of water, which has made it a pretty popular diving location for those wishing to retrieve relics. In our number four spot today, we have the SS General Slocum. This passenger steamboat was built in Brooklyn, New York, and on June 15th, 1904, it was carrying members of the St. Mark's Evangelical Lutheran Church as they were on their way to a church picnic. They were traveling up the East River on the way to Long Island Sound when a fire started in the lamp room. Considering the fact that the lamp room was obviously filled with lamp oil, while a fire on board a ship is never good, this is one of the worst case scenarios. Actually, lamp oil, oil rags, and nearby paint locker in a cabin filled with gasoline are actually what created this worst case scenario. The safety equipment of this ship was not nearly up to standards as it was rarely even checked, and when the crew attempted to get the fire hose in order to put out the flames, they found a rotten fire hose that crumbled in their hands. The life jackets being given out to people began to fall apart, and they couldn't even access the lifeboats at all. I cannot even imagine the panic people were feeling at this point. Many of the passengers saw no other option and jumped into the water to try and swim, but like many Americans at the time, they didn't know how, and the heavy wool clothes they wore only worked to weigh them down. At the end of the day, it is said that around 1,021 people lost their lives in this absolutely tragic event. In our number three spot today, we have the MV La Julia. This was a ship that was owned by the Senegalese government, and despite the fact that it was designed to carry a maximum of 580 passengers, on September 26th, 2002, the ship had at least 2,000 people on board. This is obviously a huge issue, and this, coupled with the fact that there was a large amount of people who were sleeping on the ship's deck, which is of course above the center of buoyancy, only made matters worse. The ship was en route to the Senegalese capital of Dakar, and as it sailed farther out to sea than it was licensed to sail, it ended up encountering a storm and really rough waters. The ship ended up capsizing, and out of the 2,000 people on board, only 64 people survived the entire ordeal. Not only was this because of the fact that the ship sank exceptionally quickly, but it's mostly because rescue was not sent out until several hours after. The wreck is thought to be one of the worst non-military disasters in all of maritime history. Despite the severity of the situation, no one has been charged or prosecuted for the disaster to this day. In our number two spot today, we have the MS Al Salam Boccaccio 98. This is a shipwreck that took place on the Red Sea on February 3rd, 2006. At the time of the wreck, the ship was en route from Dubai, UAE, on the way to Safaga in southern Egypt. When the ship left port, it was already listing due to poor weather, and things only got worse from here. A fire broke out in the 
engine room and it continued to burn despite the crew's best efforts to get it put out. The crew used buckets and buckets of seawater, and at one point the fire was temporarily put out, but it reignited before long. At this point, the captain tried to turn around and return to the port, but the drainage pumps weren't working properly, which meant that the hull of the ship had now filled up with water. When they tried to turn, it just resulted in the balance being all thrown off and the ship capsized. Like I mentioned before, when they set out, the weather was already bad, which of course made the rescue efforts substantially more difficult because those people also had to try and sail through this bad weather and strong winds. This left dozens out floating in the Red Sea. Sadly, it is reported that somewhere around 1,018 people lost their lives in this wreck. In our number one spot today, we have the MV Goya. This ship was built in Norway in 1940 and was meant to be a freighter, but in a World War II world, this ship ended up being used as a passenger ship in order to evacuate citizens as a part of Operation Hannibal. This, of course, as anyone could reasonably imagine, meant that the ship was very often overcrowded as they were trying to rescue as many people as possible at a time. On April 16th, 1945, the ship was carrying over 7,000 passengers, which is five times the amount of people it could safely carry when it was hit by a torpedo that was sent from a Soviet submarine just before midnight. The force of the explosion was so great that the ship only took minutes to sink, and since the timing of the incident had most passengers in their beds, you can imagine the outcome. Because of a lack of proper record keeping in with the absolute panic of trying to rescue people with the imminent threat of attack, it isn't quite clear exactly how many people lost their lives in this wreck, but it's thought that somewhere between 6,000 to 7,000 passed away, which is unbelievable. It is thought that there were around 180 survivors of the wreck, and due to the unbelievable tragedy, the location of it has now been officially declared a war grave by the Polish authorities. Number 10, the Costa Concordia. Hey, we all like to show up. Off. Maybe there's a girl watching and you want to impress her, or maybe you never resolved that deep regret of not pushing yourself harder in high school football. But sometimes you need to remember that you're at work and it's not the time to try to show off to people and show them how cool you think you are. Well, back in 2012, the captain of the Costa Concordia thought he would show everyone on the boat of an Italian cruise ship how good of a captain he was by performing a sail by. Just so you know, this is nothing like a drive by. Everything on boats is nicer. Like drinking and driving, bad. Drinking and boating, that's the only way you can get people on a boat. A sail by is when you swoop in close to a landmass to take a close look. What ended up happening is the captain misjudged how close he could get and crashed into it. After this, he tried to be a hero and help everyone on the ship. Just kidding, he abandoned ship. He treated crashing into the island like hiding pieces of that broken vase when you were playing kickball inside and your mom got mad at you. He later was arrested for manslaughter and abandoning ship. Bummer. Number 9. The MS Estonia Now here's another case of people just not really doing their job right. The MS Estonia was a smaller transport ship, used sometimes as a cruise ship but mostly as a ferry. One day it was making a pretty standard trip from Estonia to Sweden and there was 989 people on board the boat at this time. So far so good, but the cargo on the boat hadn't been placed evenly on the boat so the weight distribution was off. While making the cross, the MS Estonia got hit with a major storm and the ship leaned over to one side and began to flood. It was a devastating loss, almost every person on board didn't make it. Of the 989 people who went out, only 139 were picked up by the Coast Guard. If they had just put a little more effort into their job, like move a couple boxes to the other side of the boat, this might have not been a problem. Also I have no idea how boats work, so maybe it was a little more complicated than that. You probably shouldn't listen to me. Number 8. The SS Edmund Fitzgerald. Super fun name. The year is 1975. A big tanker is trying to cross Lake Superior. This seems like it should have been the most chill voyage ever. You're crossing a lake. You're on a big boat. It sounds like the kind of job you can do while eating a sandwich in one hand and being very hungover. But it's on this list you already know something went wrong. I'm going to tell you the truth. I have no idea how this big guy sunk. There was no distress signal sent out. Maybe it was ghost pirates. Or it could have been the hurricane winds and the 35 foot swells that were happening on the lake that day. Something weird about this shipwreck is Gordon Lightfoot made a song about it. Who's Gordon Lightfoot? I have no idea. Maybe he would be more famous if he wasn't writing songs about sunken ships. How about next time you write a song about drugs, sex, and violence so I have something to listen to while I'm meditating. Number 7. Carnival Triumph So this ship didn't sink, but it did get wrecked. 
and I had to include it on the list because it's an amazing story. So back in 2013, this cruise ship was out in the Gulf of Mexico. People were eating, drinking, partying, everyone's diet was horrible. IBS was running smoke all over this ship. It was truly a great time. Then a fire broke out in one of the engine rooms. The fire was quickly put out by the safety systems on the ship, but it damaged the ship so everything lost power. It caused the motors to stop working and sewage to back up into the passenger areas. All those margarita fueled diarrhea squirts were all over everyone, overflowing out of the toilets and it was coming back to haunt them. Poop was everywhere. It was also super hot. A bunch of stinky turds baking in the sun. They were stuck out there for four days. Four days of poop fumes dancing in their little nose holes. I guess you could say they had a crap time. <laughs> Number six, the MV Lajula. Guys, we have rules for a reason. Don't run with scissors, you're gonna fall and cut yourself. Chew your food so you don't choke like a dog inhaling a bird. And when there's a capacity limit on something, maybe you should listen. The MV Lajula was making a trip from Senegal to Dakar back in 2002, and this bad boy was three times over its capacity limit. You know what would happen if I got pulled over and blew into a breathalyzer three times over the legal limit? Well, I bet I would have had a really good night and like jail or something, I don't know. Well, the people in charge of running this boat obviously didn't care about the rules or the poor weather conditions that they were running into. They hit a storm and the ship flipped in no time. And because the weather was so bad, it took a while for rescue workers to come grab them and almost no one was recovered. Yeah, huge bummer. Number five, the MTS Oceanos. If you ever go on a cruise ship, don't cheap out. Also, if you run a cruise ship, please take care of it. The MTS Oceanos was a case of neglect on several levels. First, the cruise ship was run down. This thing was littered with loose hull plates, a hole in the bulk, and some of the ship had been stripped for spare parts. This is like taking a cruise run by your buddy Kev with a 1999 Corolla and that has 1000 water bottles in it and a garbage bag window. Don't worry man, you'll get used to the smell. On its final voyage, an explosion happened in the engine room. This is where the second level of neglect comes in. The crew couldn't fix it, so they just dipped. They didn't sound any alarms, they didn't tell passengers, they were just like, sucks to suck, and took off. After the people were left to fend for themselves, it was an entertainer on board of the boat that sent out the distress call to save everyone. I don't know who this guy is, but he's got some major big dick energy. He saved a cruise ship full of people after all hope was lost. Dude, please be my dad. Number four, MV Dona Paz. This is a situation of bad thing after bad thing after another bad thing. The MV Dona Paz was a ferry going through some transport waters in the Philippines. It was filled to the brim with passengers. This was a night voyage, so visibility was really poor. So poor that they didn't see the oil tanker coming right at them that they collided with. The MT Vector oil tanker crashed right into the Dona. This was a brutal crash, injuring many of the people on board of both ships. The oil inside the MT Vector caused a fire and there were now burning ships on both ends and oil spread into the water and literally burning oil on top of the water. People tried to save themselves by jumping into the water, but between the two ships, only 26 people survived. It was bad. Number three, the USS Arizona. On December 7th, 1941, a date that will live in infamy. When you listen to the old recording of that broadcast, it sounds like Palpatine. I wonder if when the Americans made the decision to join the war, someone in the back was like, do it, do it America. The sinking of the USS Arizona is of course one of the most famous of all time. It was an attack from the Japanese on the Americans, which brought the Americans into World War II. It was a major tragedy and only one third of the ship's crew ended up making it out alive. There's a memorial site at the sunken site to remember what happened that day. I don't know much about history, but I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that it was a bad move to attack Pearl Harbor. It eventually led to the dropping of two atomic bombs, the most powerful bombs on the planet at that time. You could have said that those bombs had unlimited power. Number two, the Titanic. What can I tell you about this boat that you don't already know? Leonardo DiCaprio fell in love on it, he banged some chick in a car, and then he died of hypothermia. The end, I just saved you seven hours or however long that movie is. Trust me, you don't wanna waste your time watching that movie. An extended cut of Avengers Endgame just got announced and it's way more worth it. Well, for those of you that don't know, the Titanic was supposed to be a marvel of technology and thought to be completely unsinkable. 
They were so confident in the boat's ability that there wasn't enough lifeboats and there was no safety briefing given out to the passengers beforehand. The ship then smashed into an iceberg and some dude fell into a propeller and then a bunch of rich people froze to death. The end. I don't know if you guys heard about this but they built a second titanic that's going on the same route as the original boat. At least this time when it sinks I get to watch the whole thing happen on Instagram live. Number 1. Wilhelm Gustloff the sinking of the Wilhelm Gustloff was a major tragedy. It was the most lives lost in the sinking of a boat ever. Over 9,000 people died. It was back in 1945 when this boat was making its trip across Baltic waters. And I want everyone to understand that everyone on this boat was a civilian. There was no weapons, the ship wasn't smuggling anything, there was no secrets to be had on this boat. It was about halfway through its voyage when the Wilhelm Gustav was attacked by Soviet military. The Soviet battleship shot three torpedoes at the vessel, causing it to sink immediately. People were thrown from the ship just based on the force of the impact. But it wasn't the weapons that would be these people's fate, but the negative temperatures. Many people on board died from the freezing cold waters. 